So that is middle year structure. Let's focus our attention to the last compartment, the inner year. So inner year also share lots of intricate anatomy, and we're just going to go through some of the basic one that you need to know, and you need to inspect on every single uh, study of temporal bone. So I will look at the facial nerve, I will look at the cochlea and vestibule and semicircular canal. Then lastly, I will look for the caliber of vestibular aqueduct. So start with the facial nerve. Facial nerve, as you recall, uh, cannot be visualized on CT. You can see the facial nerve canal, but the facial nerve itself, you won't be able to visualize. For that, you need an MRI, especially a heavily T2-weighted thin section uh, MRI, such as T2-space or Fiesta or CIS. Here you can see, if you remember the anatomy, the facial nerve is extending curve around the back of the brainstem, then extending through the anterior portion of the internal auditory, can auditory canal and extending into a small labyrinthine segment and extending into genicular ganglia. There it takes a sharp bend, so the anterior genute. And that become a horizontal posterior extension, a linear straight shot through the tympanic cavity, so that become the tympanic segment then reaches just underneath, just uh, deep to the uh, pyramid that we talked about earlier. And then they turn another sharp turn, this time going from superior to inferior, become the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. So on CT, again, you won't be able to directly visualize the nerve itself. So you just have to imagine where they are. It's going to be on the interior part of the external, excuse me, internal auditory canal. Here you can see it extending up through this small labyrinthine segment, take a bend right here, so that's an anterior genute, and then it takes a straight shot uh, horizontally across the tympanic membrane, so you have a tympanic segment. You can always find the tympanic segment of the facial nerve reliably underneath the lateral semicircular canal. So if you lost your way, just locate lateral semicircular canal and then look underneath it. You should be able to find the facial nerve. So if you travel, uh, follow the facial nerve, going down here, remember that's a pyramid. Pyramid, in the center of pyramid, you can see a small soft tissue dot, that's stapedius muscle. Medial to the pyramid, this little space is sinus tympani. Lateral to the pyramid, that's the facial recess. Deep to the facial recess is where you can find the beginning of the mastoid segment of the facial nerve, which takes a superior to inferior dive. Again, let's trace it backwards. Follow the arrow, facial nerve, facial nerve, tympanic segment, anterior genute, genicular ganglia is going to be right here, and the uh, labyrinthine segment then extending into the canalicular segment, extending along the anterior aspect of the internal auditory canal. Here, internal auditory canal takes a anterior bend, that's a genicular ganglia. Take a sharp uh, anterior genute, extending into the tympanic segment, then you become the then become the uh, uh, posterior genu and take a sharp dive from superior to inferior into the mastery segment. On the coronal view, the facial nerve is look like a uh, right above the cochlea, which look like a snail, Gary the snail sign. The snail is a cochlea. The eye of the snail is a facial nerve coming toward you and away from you. So when the eye is crossed, that's the anterior genute. And then you can follow, by the way, the mouth of the snail is the uh, tensor tympani muscle and the tendon. And you can follow the outer eyes, the facial nerve, which becomes the tympanic segment. Remember, when the eye is crossed, that's the anterior genute. And if you follow it backwards, then that becomes the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. 
If you lost your way, the easiest way to find facial nerve again is to locate the lateral semicircular canal and just look underneath it. You will see this dot roughly about halfway or maybe less than halfway uh, underneath the lateral semicircular canal. Again, it should be sitting right outside, not inside the oval window. If you see the facial nerve too close or extend inside the facial nerve, oh, excuse me, the oval window, make sure you draw attention to that. Then find the lateral semicircular canal, so that's the tympanic segment, tympanic segment, and then it takes a sharp dive, the posterior genu, and that extends from superior to inferior, that becomes the master segment. Eventually exit it and then wrap around, going laterally to the, fa to the product gland and the innervate various uh, facial muscles. So that's a general configuration of the facial nerve. You want to make sure that you follow the uh, normal anatomical uh, course. Uh, this is an example of a uh, patient comes in with an acute right side facial droop. And here, highlighted by the arrow, you can see asymmetric enhancement. Um, this is the, right here, this is the anterior genute. You can see follow in the tympanic segment is apparently enhanced compared to the left side. And on the coronal view, you can also follow this a very nicely asymmetric enhancement of the anterior genute. And then when you follow it backwards, you can see that there's an asymmetric enhancement of the, uh, the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. So this is a Bell's palsy. It's reaction to herpes simplex, and that should uh, spray across inflammation or spray across the facial nerve. An important thing of note is if the symptom is very classic, if the clinician is very confident about a diagnosis of Bell's palsy, you don't need imaging to make that diagnosis. The purpose of image, though, is that if the symptom becomes atypical, for example, if patient was treated and then did not resolve as expected, then you may want to do the imaging to make sure that you're not being fooled by other entity especially you don't want to be fooled by perineural spray of a product malignancy. Remember the facial nerve would extend in uh, across uh, superficial to the product gland. So one of the way the product malignancy may travel is through the facial nerve. So that's a purpose of imaging for quote unquote Bell's palsy. Lastly, the inner, other inner ear structures, the cochlea, vestibule, and semicircular canal. So the balancing organ and the hearing organ that we all learn about in medical school and before medical school. So cochlea, as you know, it looked like a snail, Gary the snail sign, it sort of spiral up. The uh, fluid, the perilymph spiral up and down, uh, extending from the oval window from the top and got decompressed out of the round window in the bottom. So on the axial view, you can see, you can locate the cochlea. You want to make sure cochlea has a nice two and a half turn. So one basal turn, two second turn, and nice half apical turn. And for this particular image, you want to inspect that, make sure the inside of the cochlea, you have this nice bony box, the modiolus. Extending from modiolus, you want to see this very nice uh, septation, that's interscalar septum forming this nice indentation and the apical turn. You want to make sure all the structure, structure are intact. The aperture of the facial nerve should be nice and wide open. Again, modiolus, the bony box should be nice and well seen. There are certain pathology that uh, some, some or all of the feature may be missing. Specifically, I'm dealing with the congenital uh, inner ear anomaly. So you want to make sure that all this uh, structure are intact. Then on the coronal view, coronal view, uh, cochlea looked like a snail. Again, Gary, the snail sign. The eye of the snail is the facial nerves. The mouth or the uh, nose of the snail is the tensor tympani muscle and the tendon. You want to make sure that it has a nice spiral and the end of the spiral is going to be that little indentation look like a small air pocket. Remember that is wrong window. And on the top, this uh, indentation right here, that's the oval window. You want to make sure both of, the, both of them are well aerated. The cochlea, you want to make sure that it's, it's loosened and hypodense, not abnormally dense inside. 
for the vestibule and the semicircular canal, you remember vestibule is this bulbous dilatation at the base of the semicircular canal. There are three pairs of semicircular canal. You have superior semicircular canal, lateral semicircular canal, and posterior semicircular canal. Remember, if you want to find the location of the facial nerve, just look for the lateral semicircular canal and find the facial nerve traversing underneath it. And the important thing is that you also want to make sure not just the configuration is normal, but you want to make sure that especially the superior semicircular canal is covered by bone. Here you can see uh, bulbous dilatation of the vestibule, superior semicircular canal, lateral semicircular canal. Notice that in this case, though, there's a very, very thin covering, bone covering. You can even argue that there might be a questionable dehiscence of the superior semicircular canal here. So look for all those structures. And just a quick orientation, you hear this mnemonic before. If you look at the facial nerve, uh, the, inter excuse me, the internal auditory canal, if you cut it in half and look on fast, um, look down the barrel, you should be able to see four dots of nerve. The anterior two nerve represented is the facial nerve and the cochlear division of the eighth cranial nerve. So the mnemonic is seven up, coke down. So the seven facial nerve is anterior superior in location, and the cochlear nerve is anterior inferior in location. So it's seven up, coke down. And I also like to li add my uh, another mnemonic, which is a VA on the back shelf. Nobody like VA juice, so we put them on the back shelf. That's a nice mnemonic because V stands for vestibular and eighth cranial nerve. So this is a vestibular division, superior vestibular nerve of eighth cranial nerve and sub inferior vestibular division of the eighth cranial nerve. So seven up, coke down, VA on the back shelf. By that relationship, you can also get a sense that the cochlea is going to be more anterior and inferior compared to vestibule, which is going to be more posterior and superior as far as their, their localization. And when you look at all those uh, uh, inner ear structure, if you deal with congenital anomaly, there are a couple of checklists that you can do. Number one, look at the cochlea. Make sure cochlea has a nice two and a half turn, basal turn, second turn, apical turn. You want to make sure that when you look at the cochlea, all the important structure is intact, such as modiolus. You want to make sure the cochlear aperture is nice and open. You want to make sure the interscalar septum is well visualized and intact, has a nice indentation at the very attachment point. You want to make sure the lateral semicircular canal is nicely formed. Lateral semicircular canal is the last one to form. So in theory, if this one's normal, other two is likely normal. Not always, but more likely they will be normal. So look for lateral semicircular canal. Look at the caliber of the uh, internal auditory canal. And also look for this small structure that's roughly parallel to the posterior semicircular canal. That's the vestibular aqueduct. And we'll come back to that just in, in, a, in a little bit. This is an example of where some of the structure is not quite <clears throat> intact. So, for example, you can see the apical term right here is not very nicely formed. It's a little bit uh, dilated and half formed and a little bit cystic. Notice that the modiolus is also not well visualized, or there's missing of the interscalar septum. You can barely see a small uh, basal modiolus. There's a modiolus deficiency. Notice that there's a large dilatation of this structure, which is vestibular aqueduct, roughly parallel to the posterior semicircular canal. That's very, very abnormally enlarged. So this is a classic example of the incomplete partition type 2, classically known as the Mondini's malformation, although we try to discourage using the term Mondini's malformation. This is incomplete, incomplete partition type 2. So other stuff that, that's in the template that we mentioned earlier, we specifically talk about uh, two pathology, no evidence of, which is labyrinthitis ossificans and otospongiosis. 
Uh, let's just go over uh, uh, what do they look like, and I think this is a nice board exam question. So this is an example of 18-year-old with cystic meningitis, now present with left-sided hearing loss. So presumably right side is the normal side. We can use that as a reference. If you look at the left side, notice that the inner ear structure, this lateral semicircular canal, the cochlea, do you remember cochlea should be nice and loosened or uh, hypo, hypo dense within? The entire cochlea appear abnormally dense. So is the lateral semicircular canal. If you look at the coronal view, the superior semicircular canal and the lateral semicircular canal is abnormally dense. So is the spiral of the cochlea. So there's abnormal density inside. This is a classic example of labyrinthitis ossificon. Essentially, you can think of labyrinthitis ossificon as an autoimmune response to something that's irritating the inner ear stuff. Uh, things such as trauma, such as prior inflammation, or blood got inside there. Then it became to become, initially, start with acute labyrinthitis, and then essentially it may become ossified. So you want to make sure that you inspect all those areas. So uh, on the board exam, they will ask you some of the more common cause of labyrinthitis ossificum, which is abnormal density inside within the inner ear structure. Not to confuse, not to confuse with this entity, this patient has graduate bilateral hearing loss. Notice that the cochlea, you can see the inside of the cochlea is nice and loosened, but the outside of the cochlea normally should be very, very dense bone. Let me uh, show you the example of normal cochlea, excuse me, normal cochlea. Notice that the surrounding cochlea, the, the, the bone should be very, very dense normally. In our case, there's abnormal lucency outside. So rather than abnormal density inside, now you have abnormal lucency outside of the inner ear structure. So this is autospongiosis, which is also same as autosclerosis. <clears throat> you might find this terminology a little bit confusing because it seems like complete opposite in terms of description. One's autospongiosis, one's autosclerosis, they mean the same thing. Compare that to labyrinthitis ossificum, that's abnormal density inside. Autosclerosis, autospongiosis is abnormal lucency outside. The reason why radiologists prefer autospongiosis is because we can see that. We can see there's abnormal spongiform or lucency in the area that it should be dense. But in the lay phases though, it becomes sclerotic. So therefore, clinicians refer to them as autosclerosis. There are two subtypes. This is actually a more rare type the cochlear form. The much more common type is a fenestral form. But the reason why you probably won't see that on your board exam is this is usually a small lesion and it's a uh, little lucency adjacent to the foot plate or adjacent to the oval window. So this is probably unfair, too much of an eye exam for, uh, for the purpose of board exam. So you probably will see if they will show you the uh, autospongiosis Likely, they're going to show you the cochlear form. But in real life, the fenestral form is way more common than the cochlear form. A nice cartoon from StatDX shows uh, the reason why the fenestral form would cause uh, conductive hearing loss is because they tend to adhere the foot play to the oval window, cause dysfunction. So lastly, uh, another structure that you should always inspect, especially for congenital hearing loss, is vestibular aqueduct. Vestibular aqueduct is very easily located by this small canal right here that's roughly parallel, not quite, but roughly parallel to the posterior semicircular canal. What is the normal size? It should be smaller than the adjacent posterior semicircular canal. If that's too bigger than the posterior semicircular canal, it's likely abnormally enlarged. So make sure to inspect the vestibular aqueduct. One of the more common board exam questions is, what is the most common uh, imaging finding or cause for congenital sensory neural hearing loss? The answer is 
enlargement of the vestibular aqueduct. Bilateral. In this case, it's bilateral. Again, the vestibular aqueduct should be smaller than the adjacent posterior semicircular canal. In this case, clearly, the vestibular aqueduct is bigger than the posterior semicircular canal. So that's a large vestibular aqueduct. It's a common board exam question. It is associated. By the way, on MRI, you won't see the uh, cerebral uh, the uh, uh, aqueduct itself. So you will see its endolymphatic sac. So you see abnormally dilated endolymphatic sac. And remember, it's an important feature for incomplete partition type 2, the Mondini's malformation, but it's not part of the feature of incomplete partition type 1. So that's a general approach. And, and then everything else. And look at the vasculature, the vessels, the jugular vein, jugular fossa. Look at the uh, carotid and carotid canal. And look at bone, uh, uh, brainstem, brain, uh, orbit, sinus, etc. So here, uh, let me just show you quickly and make sure that you follow the, uh, the uh, jugular vein and follow the carotid canal. Make sure they are not dehiscent. In this case, that uh, some people uh, on the axial views, some say it look like rubber ducky. The head of the rubber ducky is for the jugular fossa is the pars nervosa. That's the nice cranial nerve goes through, and the the body of the rubber ducky is pars vascularis. So cranial nerve ten and eleven is going through that area. And on the coronal view, make sure that uh, another, again, the important landmark of the cochlear promontory, the crada canal should be coarse medial inside of the cochlear promontory, not going across or lateral to it. If you see that, that's abnormal. This is an example of the abnormal case focused on the right side. You can see the cochlear promontory, find the basal term of the uh, cochlea, cochlear promontory, there is a abnormal uh, uh, structure that's sitting just lateral to the cochlear promontory. So in this case, you can see a continuous extension into the carotid canal. That's a barren vessel. Remember two other differential diagnoses if it's a focal lesion. Think about congenital cluster teatoma or glomus, uh, glomus tumor. Here again, you can see this aberrant vessel that's extending lateral to the cochlear promontory and connected into the carotid canal. So that is the aberrant uh, internal auditory canal. Just a nice diagram showing you that normally, if the internal auditory canal, excuse me, the internal carotid artery failed to form, it would be taken over by this aberrant vessel, uh, inferior tympanic artery and that will course just lateral to the cochlear promontory, as in this case. Okay, so that's a lot to go through. So in summary, that you want to inspect all three compartments, break them into three compartments, outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. You want to approach systematically from outside and in, focus one side at a time. So for, for outer ear, inspect the ear, external outer canal, the connection can see that better than we can sometimes, Tympanic membrane, look at the mastery air cell, add it as an entrance. Make sure everything is well aerated. In our ear structure, the structure that you want to inspect is the middle ear cavity. Break them into three parts, the epitemponin, etic, mesotemponin, hypotemponin. Look at how sharp the scutum is. Make sure the pusac space is okay. The ossicle is intact in its normal configuration. Make sure that the oval window and the round window are well aerated. You can also inspect the facial nerve at this time. Make sure they follow the normal anatomical course. Lastly, look at the inner ear structures. Pay attention to the cochlea, vestibule, and the semicircular canal. Make sure the semicircular canal does, is not dehiscent. And look at the size of vestibular aqueduct. Compare that to the adjacent posterior semicircular canal. Lastly, look at the internal artery canal. Make sure the caliber is okay. And finally, look at everything else. Look at the vessel, make sure they are not apparently coarse. Make sure that the carotid canal is not, uh, there's no bony dehiscence over it. And look at the orbit, look at the parts that you can see. 
uh, take a look at the brain stem and the brain. That's about everything. So thank you very much for your attention.